Okay, I guess this is a real mic now. This is very impressive. So, uh, at one time they, we talked uh, about these as being Toonie talks. Um, that was 15 years ago when a Toonie would buy you something. But uh, since then, we've got better. The cost has gone up for everything. And so we're suggesting that uh, if you have the opportunity, please make a donation uh, somewhere around the cost of a beer. And uh, so I'm going to ask our volunteer here to uh, just make uh, the collection. And uh, for those of you that have already registered or those of you that um, would like to, you can do so on the, uh, on the uh, uh, Eventbrite uh, system. And uh, that's our uh, collection so far uh, for the 2023 uh, series. So we're uh, partway to our goal, as you can see. So next thing I think I want to mention is uh, where we are in terms of our schedule. And uh, these talks, uh, there's three more left after tonight. Uh, they are on every uh, Wednesday evening at 7.30. And uh, we finish finally on the 12th of April. And by that time, uh, it should be bright. There should be no uh, snow except probably the ice in the harbor. And uh, you should all be out there working on your boats. So uh, the talks are open to everyone. And uh, all the talks are going to be recorded. And they'll be available on the YouTube channel, uh, NSC's YouTube channel, uh, about a week after the uh, actual uh, live talk takes place and so you can go back and have a look at a chat at anything you missed or if you want to go and uh, perhaps pay a little bit further attention to something that you uh, have looked at so now here's our volunteer team and I wanted to mention that there's two groups that organize these talks there's a foreground group and I guess I'm part of that uh, but it's also supported by a fairly substantial AV group that streams all of the talks. And so in no random or no order whatsoever, I'll just go over the names. Uh, Tony Wright, Stephen Kidd, Mark Edwards, Jason Zare, Richard Kellen, Ron Evans, and Mark Rand. And as well, uh, Sean Batten, our uh, sailing manager, uh, is also our uh, streaming director and producer of these talks. And uh, you already know me, I'm Park Davis. So uh, all of the speakers, all of the organizers, we're all volunteers. We run on volunteers. So uh, if you have stories you want to talk about next year, uh, or if you want to replace me, please feel free to do so. Uh, please just come ahead. Uh, there's always room for another person in showbiz up here. So uh, you can uh, connect to us at Winter Speaker at nsc.ca, and uh, we'll be happy to hear from you. Uh, this is a primary way in which we can get new speakers to come in and uh, talk about their experiences or their nightmares on the water, whatever it happens to be. So uh, in any case, please feel free to uh, get in touch with us. Now, next week, uh, we have a talk, Keeping Your Boat at NSC, but uh, I think it's probably uh, available or applicable, let's say, to anybody that uh, is thinking about joining a sailing club or a boating club as to what you can expect uh, from harbor and harbor facilities. So uh, our uh, harbor master, uh, Corey Glynn, is going to be here and he's going to bring some of his uh, others uh, with him to talk about everything associated with our harbor facilities. So how to launch your boat and how to haul out, uh, how to use the cranes here, how to use the pump out systems, the water, the electricity, and how to uh, keep our clean designation as a uh, 
uh, a clean uh, club, uh, and that is from an environmental perspective. So all of those things are coming up next week. So tonight, let's go to tonight. So uh, we're going to be talking to the gentleman here from the Canadian uh, Power and Sales Squadron. So um, tonight we have two people, uh, Court Harkness, um, and we also have Axel Obanoff, uh, both from the Canadian Power and Sales Squadron. So the Canadian Power and Sales Squadron, it's a national nonprofit organization with a mission to be the foremost educational voting authority in Canada. Now, initially, when we were talking to uh, our two speakers, when I was talking to our two speakers tonight, they were each explaining their roles in the organization. I said, well, you work for him. And they said, no, not exactly, because he works for you. And so it's hard to tell who's who, because they both had various jobs with various levels. And uh, so I'll basically say that uh, uh, Court has been the past uh, commander of the Ottawa Squadron, and uh, Axel is the current commander of the Ottawa Squadron since 2019. And uh, in 2021, he was elected also to become the Rideau District Commander. So uh, we have uh, two fairly leading lights of uh, uh, the organization here tonight. Now, I guess in past, I guess I, I looked at some of the background that Axel had uh, presented as to why he became uh, so involved in some of the educational aspects of uh, the Canadian Power and Sales Squadron. And I suspect that more than anything else, that came from when he first rented a houseboat on the Big Rideau. And after, I guess, the week or 10 days he was out there, he realized how little he knew and how much he had to gain to do it safely next time. And so uh, he ended up taking a whole series of courses, and I guess that's pretty much what all of us do, either take courses or we learn through hard knocks one way or the other, and we probably do both of those things over the years. But uh, as I say, over the years, uh, having taken many of these courses, he now has become uh, the teacher of many of these courses, uh, an educational officer for the Ottawa Squadron, and now, as I mentioned, uh, he's commander uh, of both the Ottawa and Rideau Squadrons. And uh, we have Court as well, who uh, has uh, the same levels and the same edu educational background uh, that uh, uh, I've talked about Axel with. So I'm going to start off, I believe, Court, you're going to be the first speaker. So, if you'd like to come forward, and uh, thank you very much. Is that where you want to start? Or? Sure, yeah, okay. thank you. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little, a little history of my background. Uh, I've been in boating since I was eight years old, uh, mostly sailing. So, I was a sailmaker for six years, both here in, uh, in Kingston and in New Zealand. Um, and uh, extensively racing, you know, not cruising. Uh, I got involved with this organization late in life. Um, we, <coughs> like Axel, rented, rented a houseboat and uh, went up and down the Rideau for a week. And uh, at the end of that, my wife whispered in my ear and said, I think we should get a boat. I realized she didn't know what she was getting into, but um, that was my first foray into a motorboat. So we bought a boat and had it for almost 10 years. So, and uh, <clears throat> I thought it prudent to, to uh, even though I had a certain, uh, you know, a, a fairly decent sailing background, that um, there were still some things to learn. So I joined the squadron um, and took a bunch of their courses. So I had to, uh, uh, you know, and I've taken almost all of them except the sailing course. So, um, <clears throat> I didn't think I really needed that one. So, uh, the organization got started uh, back in 1938. 
um, when three, three fellows at the Windsor Yacht Club were invited by uh, the United States Power and Sail Squadrons to come to Detroit, which is just across the river, and take a course. So they took a course called junior piloting. And um, I'm not sure just what the, the extent of that course was, but they all passed it. And when they came back, <clears throat> they decided uh, to set up their own organization and uh, so started the, the Canadian Power and Sail Squadrons. Uh, back then, it was just the Canadian Power Squadron. They had, hadn't included sail yet. So um, <clears throat> at any rate, they. Uh, they went to work out of, uh, out of Windsor and they, they got a charter for, uh, for the organization and, and designed a flag. And as people got wind of it, it, it started to expand. It became quite popular. Um, other squadrons uh, formed uh, in and around Windsor first and then it, it expanded uh, and eventually expanded right across the country because uh, it's now, uh, you know, goes right from coast to coast. You know, I, I won't add a third coast because I don't think we have any squadrons up in the north. Although we do have some people in the squadron, connected to the squadron, that teach um, the PCOC to Inuit. And that's a whole new experience because what they think they need for, for a boat is totally different what you would what you would have down down here. So um, for a recreational thing, because they're they're they use um, <clears throat> those are working folks. I mean they they're out fishing and hunting and whatnot. So you know um, they don't have life jackets. They don't you know have sort of the paraphernalia that we we have at hand. Uh, they they take a rifle on their boat, you know, to hunt seal and whatnot. So um, they don't entirely understand all the learning uh, points that are required for a, a pleasure craft operator certificate because a lot of it just, just doesn't apply to them. At any rate, uh, the, uh, the membership grew, the squadrons grew, and uh, it became stronger and stronger. So the organization itself um, is obviously a volunteer organization. Uh, a thousand, you know, hundreds and, well, thousands of volunteers that, that are dedicated to safe boating. Um, and, and in that sense, so, We've developed courses over the time. Uh, we continue to update them. We have, uh, we'll, we'll discuss the courses later, but uh, it goes all the way from the basic requirements right up to uh, the last course I took was um, a celestial navigation course. So uh, it, it's interesting. Probably never use it. I don't plan to go across the ocean anytime soon. Uh, and if I did, I'd use the electronics for as long as they lasted, as opposed to trying to pinpoint a star on a, a boat that was <coughs> up and down and over and across. Anyway, uh, a volunteer organization uh, and, uh, and they're experienced boaters, so they've been offering courses right from the beginning and uh, so it, we've been doing it since for the last 84 years. So um, the structure of the, of the organization is such that we have a national headquarters in Toronto. Okay. And from there it spreads out to what they call districts. And, and, and a district would consist of a number of squadrons. So it would pick up a region. So for instance, in this area, the Rideau District originally had 
five or six squadrons. There was two here in Ottawa. There was one in Deep River, Cornwall, Brockville, Kingston. It's now down to three. Just Ottawa has one squadron. It amalgamated with the other Ottawa squadron. Deep River finally left, um, uh, you know, gave up their warrant, as it were, and Cornwall's gone, and we're left with Brockville, Kingston, and, uh, and Ottawa. So that would form one district. Out west, the districts are fairly, are quite a bit larger, uh, can, uh, have more squadrons involved with them. Uh, so, at any rate, that, that's essentially the structure. And, and the structure is such that as a member, you'd become a member of a squadron. So the squadron that's in your area, you would become a member of that. Um, and if you wanted to take a course, you would take a course through the squadron that is closest to where you live. Okay, and we'll discuss more about the courses because as things have changed here due to the pandemic, uh, things have changed for us as well. We've had to, uh, you know, present our course. We couldn't do them in classrooms any longer, so um, we've had to go to an online system, and, and we'll talk about that later. CPS ECP. Uh, the ECP part is Escadrille Canadien Plaisant. Um, this is our vision, the mission statement. Uh, committed community of experienced voters. And teaching people how to vote safely so they can enjoy their experience. Um, we're developing our, our courses are, are being upgraded, especially in the navigational uh, scenario to um, not just include in electronics, because we have done that, but to get the latest that's coming down the pipe, especially in things like uh, Rock M and identification of your boat, AIS, and, and a number of different scenarios that are, are upgrades on, on what we've had in the past. We still teach uh, chart plotting uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, because if you lost your GPS, if you lost your electronics, you've got to, you know, you've got to be able to pilot your boat somehow. So um, we still teach dead reckoning, and, and uh, uh, depending on where you're boating, we have navigation courses for uh, for all areas. So our values. Uh, safe boating is kind of repeating myself here. Um, essentially, uh, um, our, our boating courses are, are very good. Um, we, uh, we've actually been involved with training the police services in boating and um, uh, other uh, other government sources, and we uh, we um, partner with the uh, Canadian Coast Guard as well on uh, certain aspects. That'll be coming up in the next slide. Uh, as a community, uh, we we are we do involve our try to involve our members in, in social activities. Uh, generally during the summer and and some and often through the winter through dinners and you know Christmas dinners and that sort of thing but uh, picnics and and uh, anchorages you know uh, during the depending on you know where you're sailing or boating um, get togethers at anchorages for a weekend and that sort of thing so there is there is a social aspect to it um, and then environmentally, we've actually added some environmental things uh, in terms of, of uh, I guess the best way to say it is that we, we did one, one seminar on it or one talk on it and the garbage out there is unbelievable. 
plastics and, and that sort of thing. Even in the inland waterways, uh, you can see some of it in the, uh, in, the, in the Rito system. So we try to teach, you know, we teach responsible boating in the sense of, uh, you know, protecting the environment. So we are, uh, we, we do engage with other uh, organizations and government agencies, um, law enforcement. Uh, we did have a program called AmeriP program which identified um, navigational either hazards or what have you that were missing from charts. Um, that program has been dropped because essentially uh, the Canadian Hydrographic Service that, that does our charts really only does them on demand anymore. If you want a chart um, and you want to get it from them, it's a print on demand scenario. They don't supply them and you have to pay for them because I suspect, you know, I mean, <clears throat> you'll see all your charts now on your chart plotter. So it's an electronic thing now, it's not a paper thing. So um, uh, I know in the US all their charts are free, which isn't true here, unfortunately. Um, but again, they've gone through the electronic route as well. So, um, uh, so that program is, is no longer uh, being, being uh, done. We also have, have you know, taught courses to things like sea, uh, groups like Sea Cadets and, and Boy Scouts and, and whatnot so that they can get, um, uh, we've also done PCOC with, with marinas, with marina staff. So, you know, there's a lot of people out there that, that, that need it and need the courses and necessarily don't, don't necessarily recognize, you know, that the fact that just getting a PCOC is, is seriously, is not enough. Um, it, 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 um, <clears throat> it'll let you drive the boat legally, but, but uh, really it, um, you would, uh, you would still need a lot of education on, on, you know, anchoring and, and uh, different, different uh, areas of boating, docking, etc. So courses, we offer classroom courses. We offer now online both virtual classroom online and self-study. Uh, there's a couple of versions of the, uh, of, of the, the uh, virtual online course. So, so what, we've gone to, what we've gone to, the format, uh, we can still provide classroom courses. Our courses are flexible enough that we can do that. Uh, but people now log on to, or register, they get access to the course online. All the material is there. Everything they need is on, is on, a, on a learning management system. Uh, the one we use is called Moodle. It's used by a lot of universities. All the quizzes are there. All their lecture notes are there. We have videos. Um, and uh, it's actually quite a, quite a bit of a learning experience to learn how to use one of these learning management systems because um, it's a lot different than just preparing a course, the content, et cetera, and then maybe a presentation for, a, for a, a classroom course. So there's also the self-study where, where somebody can just register, do the thing on their own time, write the exam, and, uh, and uh, do their course that way. Do you want to 
take over from here? Sure. VHF radio, Rock M. <laughs> this is important. You need a license for this. And if you have a VHF radio, um, and we're the only ones that can provide you with the course, because we're licensed to do it with the government. It's one of two government courses that we do. Uh, the PCOC, which is the uh, Operator Certificate. Transport Canada sets sort of the criteria for that. They also set up, well, it's not Transport Canada. It's uh, yeah, see, my name is Axel Omanoff, by the way. This course is put on and is regulated by Industry Canada. Uh, they're the ones that uh, license all the radios and adjust the frequencies and so on and so forth. Anyhow, this course now is going to go online. Um, we have somebody that's going to interface with Industry Canada and say, okay, how we do the examination? Well, the exam for this course uh, consists of 60 questions, uh, multiple guess, um, and uh, an oral exam. Uh, so, Having said that, the oral exam by the instructor has to be face to face. So they will teach the, you know, they have to know the phonetic alphabet and get into an emergency situation where you actually make a broadcast. Now we have simulators that we use to teach this course. So you're, you've got a handheld and, a, and the instructor has the simulator. So anyhow, this course will now go online and that's Sorry? within the next few months, I think. Um, yeah, it's pretty close to it. Yeah. The other thing too is uh, this particular course uh, and a few of the others are also um, in both languages, both official yeah, languages. They're, yeah, we're, all our courses are uh, bilingual. And, and we actually, do have a few uh, bilingual instructors. On the West Coast, some of them are in Mandarin Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you can appreciate the size of the squadrons out West. They can sail all year long. So here, we have to put our boats away and you know take courses in the winter. They take courses all year. Um, let's see, we'll get the next slide up. Just here. Okay, like boating license, again, this is a, uh, uh, we're kind of low in the totem pole when it comes to this PCOC. Um, we've been outshone by the Canadian tires and the, the, the others, but we're trying to get back into the market here. And one of the ways of doing it is uh, with a new online format. Uh, people want stuff online. They don't want to sit in the classroom for a course that's, you know, an hour or two long. Uh, but there are 15 items in this PCOC that are required by Transport Canada. So this, this is just basic. So it gets you the card and that's about it. Well, actually, the one thing we have going for us on this is through our associations, especially with the United States Power Squadron, <clears throat> the U.S. Coast Guard recognizes our card and our card only. So you get one from Boater Exam or one of the other groups, it's not recognized in the U.S. This card is. So you've got, um, you know. Yeah, so, so that, that, that's important. So, next course is the, uh, the basic boating course. Well, basic boating takes that PCOC information and expands it. Uh, so, from there, you've got boating two, and then I think there's boating two, three, which is an yeah. in introduction. So, there's a combined course, boating two and three together, and it introduces you to some basic navigation. What do those green and red markers mean? Uh, how to read a chart, uh, whether it be electronic or, or uh, um, paper. So this, this course expands that. Uh, you know, land-based light stations, what's a range, that kind of thing. Uh, 
um, PCOC doesn't teach you that. So if you think you know something by having a PCOC, well, you don't know anything really. It's just very basic. So this boating two and boating three expands on that. So that, that's the combined course. And there are extra modules in the, uh, attached to the three part of this course, things like trailering. Um, everybody wants to know how to trailer a boat, especially one with a runabout or uh, uh, a small, uh, uh, you know, 16 foot fishing boat or that kind of thing. You want to know how to trailer it properly. Um, and I don't think marinas teach you that. You hook it up to your truck and away you go. Uh, they, did they teach you how to launch the boat? Uh, uh, launch ramp etiquette, that kind of thing. Okay, marine near shore ma navigation. Well, this again, all of these, all of these courses are progressive. So, going into boating four, again, it expands on what was learned in boating three. Now you get into things like uh, uh, plotting a basic course, uh, even on your chart plotter. You plot a basic course by putting in things like waypoints. Um, this will do that. Uh, I'll take questions, by the way, if anybody's interested in, um, in any of these courses, uh, I will take questions. Things like fire on a boat, what do you do? It, it also takes into th consideration conning. What do you do? How do you drive your boat? Um, what are you supposed to do when, uh, you know, with, with, uh, with crew? How do you instruct crew? That kind of thing, that's all covered here. There's also an introduction to tides and currents. Yeah, here. This is basic tides and currents. Uh, uh, yeah, we're, this, this, again, this is another uh, expansion. This goes into tides and currents in a, in a big way where you're actually plotting yeah. the course and you're this calculating one. things like vectors uh, and wind and current yeah, and drift and drift and set and all those things, wave heights, um, direction of the currents and, and so on. So you, you're just progressing as you go through. Yeah, this is a coastal navigation. This yeah. is getting into big water, starting to get into big yeah. water. With this. So those people that are out west, for example, that are in, in the Vancouver area, uh, up through the, uh, up through the, that area, they benefit greatly by this. I mean, we have people out there that register for these courses, left, right, and center. Not so much here. Boating 2-3 is, is uh, of prime concern for us here, simply because we're on inland waters and the boating is different than what it is out west. Okay, now we get into the offshore marine navigation level two. That's the junior, that's the junior, that's the junior and the navigator, yeah. 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 This is where you learn how to uh, take sights by the moon, the sun, the stars using a sextant. That was the old days. Today, you use a chart plotter. <laughs> and yeah, they've uh, <laughs> revamped the course to go yeah, electronic. This, this, is, this is completely different. When I took the course not too long ago, actually, um, we were using a sextant and uh, trig tables and all kinds of mathematical calculations and the accuracy had to be within plus or minus three miles, nautical miles, from your dead reckoning position. So, but those other courses taught you dead reckoning. Compass, time, speed. So this, this one will expand on that. Question, yes? Well, would you mind coming to the microphone? Yeah, thank you. Okay. I, I just
just wonder where these courses fit into the old designations like AP and Junior Navigation. Yeah. They're, they're exactly the same except the numbers have changed. Right. So, so you, if you get your AP, if you're, if you're boating four, for example, that would be your AP. No, no, boating uh, four boating was five. seamanship, boating five is AP. Boating five, sorry. Okay. Boating five is yeah. AP. So you would so get... they renamed them. Yeah. Yeah, well, that still gives uh, you an AP. It, so you it, can put an AP behind your name. You can still do it that way. I mean, <laughs> yeah. if you don't have electronics, that's what I would just still no. do it. You know. yeah. so, the, uh, those designations are coming back, by the way. Uh, these names are, are uh, sometime in the near future, we're going to go back to the uh, proper description of what these courses actually are, like B2, B3, B1, B, B5. It tells you nothing, really. Um, and, and that's our fault. Uh, and we realize that um, marketing plays a big role in how we sell these courses. Yeah. Any other questions so far? Anyhow. That's the second course. That's that gives you the yeah the uh, the uh, the, ju the course before this is really just sunshots, and the moon and maybe a planet yeah. or two that you can see. The uh, the senior course or the the senior course is is stars etc. Yeah, well, when you do a sunshot, you get things like the meridian transits. And, yeah, yeah. You know when is the sun exactly at its peak and how the, far uh, are you off on either side? So an interesting little story is my father-in-law was in the Merchant Marine during the war. So I asked him about this. I asked him if, you know, what it was like trying, you know, taking shots out in the ocean when you were on a freighter doing this and this. And I said, we never shot the stars, you could never find them. <laughs> you couldn't get, you know, you couldn't, we just, they just did it by sunshots. So a noon, a noon sunshine, you know, and uh, noon, and uh, and I suspect that back then too they had lanes that they were in, so there was a lot of dead reckoning as well. They had a pretty good idea where they were. Yeah, you can you can imagine trying to find a, a star or or a planet, and trying to keep one eye on the horizon, and the other on on the star that you're shooting with with a with a sextant, and you're doing this. So you'll never you'll never get it right. So sun and the moon, those are the the keys. Uh, let's see. So that's boating seven. Uh, that's which, it for the navigation courses. Yeah, that's that concludes the navigation course. And this one here, sailing. Well, that's more your interest. That's a basic sailing course where it teaches the theories yeah. and whatnot. I don't. On water training is. Uh, is one of the things that we try and avoid, and not try and avoid, but we typically don't do. And one of the reasons is the question of liability. Um, and, and it's happened before where uh, we've taught somebody and, and you know, lawyers get involved and uh, so on and so forth. And, and it, person can get sued if, if something happens. So we kind of keep this one low key. Um, if you want to volunteer to teach somebody how to drive their boat or sail, feel free, but don't take any compensation because that puts you up, that makes you liable. Anyhow, I digress. So sailing, basic sailing course. Um, I don't think we've don't ever taught one about that one. Yeah. We've never taught a sailing course. So if anybody wants to join us <laughs> and teach us how to sail. Uh, radar for boaters. Uh, again, it's a new course that's come out recently. So if you have a radar set on your boat and you want to learn how to use it, um, yeah. Take it. Take yeah, the we uh, we have some people that are, are pretty good on instructing yeah. this particular the electronic courses. So the and of course the other thing too is uh, with an online course, location isn't is important. 
So if we don't have an instructor here, and you're taking the course online, that, that really doesn't matter. We could have an instructor from out west. The only issues are the time changes, but um, uh, you, you can do that. You can you can get instructors from anywhere. And uh, as a matter of fact, we found that with since we've done the online thing, is I've done, you know, I've done the weather course and had people from all over the country. And you know, and the, and the guys out west, they come in at four o'clock for a seven o'clock session. Um, and people from down east, Montreal, so it's, it's yeah. what it does is it allows us to give a course uh, where in the classroom scenario, especially with the fact that now you generally have to pay for the venue, so if you don't get enough students to break even, you're not going to get the course, and you can't do that for too long. So you'd have to cancel the course and you'd lose all the students. This way we don't lose students. Yeah, anyway, that was a, uh, a new course. This one here, Boat and Engine Maintenance, uh, is a, one of our more, more popular yeah. ones yeah. in that it teaches basic maintenance. Um, what to look for if, a, if, if perhaps your, your boat fills with water and you know that the bilge pump's not broken. Well, you want to know how to fix it. Um, a lot about diesel engine. Yeah, diesel, at least when I gas. took the course, it was it was it was uh, it's a good course. This one's yeah. a this one is, is, a, is yeah. a good course. Yeah. It it covers things like um, boat construction, wood, cement, fiberglass, plastic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it doesn't doesn't just cover power boats and sailboats. It covers things like kayaks and canoes, and, and so on. And then that's one of our. Um, forward-looking things is, is people on paddle boards, kayakers, canoeists. We're trying to get those people involved as well because they're, they're boaters just like everybody else. Um, anyhow, so uh, that's uh, boat and engine maintenance. And everybody's favorite, marine electrical systems. Uh, that's a fairly new course for us as well. Um, we've taught it out west. One of the, yeah, one of the issues with this course and why it wasn't offered earlier is because in the boating industry there was no standardized electrical setup. I mean, there was no code for electricity in boats. I mean, every boat, every new boat that came out was wired differently. So it was really difficult to present a common uh, you know, resource for everybody to work on. That has changed. Um, now new boats do follow a, a particular, what's it called, ABY or something? ABYC, American ABYC, Boating yeah. and Yachting. Uh, so this, you know, I, I wish this had been around when I had my boat, I don't, because. Yeah, there's I, always, there's always a flaw somewhere that, that you're trying to find or something that you got a stray current somewhere and you can't find it. Well, this course will uh, at least give you a basic idea of where to find things. Um, weather for boaters. This is <laughs> the guy that wrote it. Um, new course and it's a, a a weather course that's designed for the recreational boater. Uh, you know, sailors like you guys or power boaters or whatever, they want to know what the weather's going to be like just by looking outside. Um, you know, there's, there's things like the weather forecast and marine forecasts, all those things. The uh, course will cover that. And, um, yeah, the... the the course is a, is, is a basic weather course. There's not a huge amount of meteorology in it. There, the first module uh, of the course gives you a basic understanding of what causes the weather um, and what causes it to change, which is what you're most interested in is the trends. So it deals with that. It deals with the weather makers. It, it looks at air masses and fronts. 
and how to recognize when they're approaching, how to forecast them. Uh, it, there's a section on uh, cloud recognition to use in forecasting, for your own personal forecasting. And then there's a, there's a, a section on forecasting per se, you know, what to take away from a, a weather forecast for your purposes on the water, um, how to stay aware of what's going on, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I know most people um, get away with not doing much in the way of weather forecasting, but you do need, you do need to be, uh, to have up-to-date forecasts, especially if you're going out longer than a couple of hours. I mean, it's pretty, um, I mean, you can still get in trouble in a couple of hours because on a warm, humid day, you might get um, uh, air mass thunderstorm, you know, developing because um, over land and then, you know, you, you, you walk into it and all of a sudden, hey, wait a minute, nobody said that was going to happen. But if you'd been listening, especially now, I mean, they're getting very good at forecasting that, um, you know, you're getting updated all the time. Now, most of these are land forecasts, but on inland waterways, they're going to cover you. If you're out on the coasts, in Environment Canada has a great marine weather you know, forecasting system and a lot of information there in terms of, uh, so that's what this course will, this course will offer you. Um, we have some, well, we're gonna talk about seminars in a minute. Uh, I'm still developing more and more for this course, which will get into things like weather radar and more advanced uh, weather topics. For those that, you know, are out for a longer period of time and need to, uh, especially around if you're on bigger water. So, um, at any rate, don't get me started. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Okay, now we come down to seminars. We have several. Um, they're great short courses. They're, you know, anywhere from 90 minutes to a couple hours long. Um, you cover various topics. I'm not sure whether we even listed any of them here, but yeah, I have. There's, there's, there's a whole bunch. Um, I mean, we can, we can uh, uh, point you to the website, and you, there's a whole list of seminars, and they can be made available at any time. All we have to do is advertise. Well, we do advertise. Well, we so. do advertise, and you can yeah, request. And you, yeah, and you can, re you can request uh, a course. Or, um, that kind of thing. So we do have lots of seminars available, and they cover things, uh, things like boating uh, or uh, weather, um, yeah. celestial navigation in a nutshell, for example. There's another one, um, although we don't do celestial anymore, but it explains it. It explains what, what celestial navigation is all about. Uh, GPS, this one here would probably be uh, very popular. Um, how many of you here have GPS? Okay, three or four of you. That, that's great. Um, so with GPS, we, we have a basic course on GPS. How to use it uh, and so on. How to tie it in with your uh, chart plotters and, and existing electronics. Like You can even link it to your, uh, your VHF. You'll learn how actor, uh, how um, <laughs> God, accurate it really is. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's plus or minus three. Yeah, that, and you can, you can find that on your chart plotter. I've I've seen this happen. You know, you go by and the mark is supposed to be here, and uh, it's not. It's you know a hundred yards off somewhere, or you know few meters out somewhere else and um, so it does have its issues still. Yeah, Touched there's the, uh, an interesting thing with, with the GPS. If you're going through the cut, um, going to um, Newborough Lock, if you go through that narrow channel, on, on my chart plotter I'm on land. <laughs> so it's, it's plus or minus. 
uh, tropical weather for boaters. This is a new course for us. Um, it was developed by somebody going south? Yeah, Brian Reese. Brian Reese? Yeah. Okay, so this is, this is a new, fairly new course for us. And, and it's for uh, those people who go to uh, the Caribbean during yeah. the, the winter. If you're chartering, chartering in the Caribbean, for example, you might want to take this one. Tides and currents. Well, I think we talked briefly about tides and currents in the uh, uh, Boating 4 and Boating 5 courses. Um, this one gives you a little bit more in depth. Uh, so how to make your calculations if you're at such and such a place and the tide table says you're there somewhere else at another location. Well, what's the difference between the tides in those places? So uh, it goes into a little bit more depth. Uh, okay, that, that concludes the courses. Uh, any questions on courses? I'll take courses from the yeah, audience. Too. Mark has. Go ahead, Mark. I'm just going to use the microphone so I don't get in trouble. Um, you've talked about chart plotters. I think a lot of people here uh, use uh, just uh, either a handheld uh, uh, iPhone or Android, or uh, they just use a laptop. Um, you can't get quite the clarity, but it's everywhere, and they're very cheap and so on. Um, I guess, do you have any comments about just using um, uh, any of those other devices rather than the more expensive chart plotters? Uh, no problem using using uh, a cell phone, uh, an iPad, uh, or any of those, uh, or computer, laptop, whatever. Those things are, are adequate. Um, but uh, if you're going on a longer trip, for example, uh, you have to worry about keeping them charged. That's that's the caveat. Um, <coughs> So unless you have, like a sailor, for example, and you're going on a longer uh, distance and you don't have a generator or solar power or that kind of thing, you have to keep in mind that those devices require a battery. Um, but they're, they're perfectly adequate for, for the conditions around here, uh, inland lakes, that's all fine. Um, so if you, if you have those, they're perfectly fine. And the principle is the same as if you had a bigger, permanently installed, dedicated chart plotter. The, uh, the, the only other thing, too, is, is if whatever app you're using requires a cellular network, <clears throat> you get out on, uh, in some of these areas where the, the cell network isn't developed that well, then you can lose, uh, you know, like you, you can't get weather forecasts, for instance, because you don't have any, um, Really, you don't have any access to the internet because your cell, the cell, the cell system is just out of range. The cell network. So, question: the uh, the weather course. Uh, how long is that course, and what's the cost roughly? Hundred and fifty. Was that the was that the ninety minute seminar? Was like a full day bigger course? Uh, <clears throat> no, we usually run it in about six weeks. Okay, um, the four modules. <coughs> It was set up that way. Uh, I'm a, I was a classroom teacher. I was a high school teacher, so um, <laughs> I designed it for a classroom and realized I had to make it flexible enough to be done online so and not like, like having six, a six good evenings. background on, yeah. online. So the four modules would be four weeks. Uh, you get a week, you know, um, so we do an introductory on how to you know, manipulate your way around the, the learning management system, and you do those. The first module is probably the most intense one in a sense, and it, it might take some people longer than a week to, to do that and do the quiz. So like, like how, how many hours would I spend to take that course? Would you spend to do it? Oh, I'd, maybe a couple hours a week. A couple hours a week, okay. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, pricing of that kind of thing is, uh, what, a couple of hundred or? 160. 160. Uh, I and, and there is a final exam, that's up to you. Um, 
it, it, uh, most people do it because it's, it, it's a scenario situation and, uh, and it's, not, it's, it's not a killer. Right. It's, it's most, multi, well it is multiple choice. And each, each module has a quiz. So, and you get marks for that. So as, as you go through it. And it is your, your seminar type things are, are much cheaper than that. They're much, much yes. shorter and much cheaper. Yeah, I, 20, yeah. 20, I was just looking $20, $30 kind of. Yeah, money. yeah, yeah. We're in that range, yeah. Right. I have a question though. Um, uh, we have a lot of sailors out here and boaters. Every year about five people get stuck on the rocks and the rocks have been in the same place since longer than the cities existed. Hmm? The rocks do not move every year. <laughs> oh, apart from the one that was discovered in the channel that nobody knew about, uh, about two years back. What should we be doing to help our community here stop make continuous and expensive stupid mistakes? Berating them doesn't work. No. There, there, there's, some, there's some educational process that we're clearly lacking because uh, and some of these people, I've been standing out here for years, so you know they're not like they're... We, we do have new people, you know, they come here to visit and they hit something, mm -hmm. but we also yeah. have people who've sailed here many years hit. Well, for the what, people what who sail here many years, you, you as a club can do this. We're starting a program this, uh, for ourselves right across the country to do this, and it's called Local Knowledge. If somebody here, uh, and I don't know, you have a paper chart of the area, but at least you could get people in and say, okay, don't go here, here, or here. And, and have somebody go out and, and uh, locate them with a GPS. So how do we structure or how do we deliver that to our thousand members? To your thousand members? Um, well, Because I don't know which, of those, which five of those thousand are going to hit rocks this year. <laughs> well, the other, the other but, thing you, you could said do. That local knowledge is a... You're saying you have a course or you have a methodology? That's what I'm asking. Is there a methodology that you guys have that we could we could explain? Well, yeah, you'd have to identify what it is. Yeah. You know what you want people to be aware of. Okay, uh, uh, and, and then uh, a thousand members. Uh, well, you're not going to get them in uh, here. Uh, you can put out your your bulletin, your newsletter, and and uh, uh, deliver if you have that. We'll and deliver it to your members in that in that way, and just have a, a whole article on on local knowledge and what you need to be aware of when you're sailing in the area of this club or wherever they're you know. The, the that other would be one the other approach. The other thing you can do is if if you know where this rock is and and it doesn't change, put a uh, a white marker on it. It could be as simple as a Javix can. Actually, that's a, that's a good point. There are there you, you'll yeah, see well, this. That's, uh, that's again, it's local knowledge, right? Yeah, you'll you'll see this throughout the system. Um, uh, cottages and uh, do that. They put up these white markers, and they're actually markers that have orange markings on them, which identify what it is you're marking. Okay, and they're legitimate navigational marks. Now, it might get a little pricey after a while if you've got a lot of them out there, but that that's one solution as well. That's as the easiest. Making everybody aware of exactly where they are. If you put you know that down, and I mean you just anchor the mark over the the rock or whatever. Yeah. You just go out in the spring option. and you mark them. Yeah, fishing boats spend every year at that marking. Yeah. yeah, they're up in the Rito. They're all over the place. I mean we've we've got rocks everywhere, and houseboats love to hit them. So even when they're marked. <laughs> oh, that's the channel, okay. And it's happened, believe me, and it's happened. Um, RVCC, this is our recreational vessel courtesy check. And if you've ever been caught without your life jackets and the police stop you, it's a $200 fine. Uh, if you don't have adequate lines, lifelines, like a buoyant heaving line, for example, $200 fine. No and it's reboarding $200 device. for each offense. So what we do is we'll come in and we have a checklist and we will, uh, with your permission, inspect your boat, 
tick off all the items, note the deficiencies, and give you a plaque at the end of the day uh, that you can put yeah. on your windshield or uh, vehicle. Anywhere you, you feel that you want to put the sticker, and the police will leave you alone. It's free. All you have to do is contact us, and we'll do it for you. You did have several years ago here. And this if, is if you want us to do it again, well. I'll leave you my card, and we'll uh, we can set it up for you. And then you give us a date, and we'll come in and and do it for you. And and what you could do is is poll your members, have a sign up sheet, so that you know we're not sitting around waiting for somebody to show up. If you want to have your vo uh, vessel checked, we'll do that for you. Yeah, we could do a number in an afternoon type yeah. of thing or something like that. It, it takes During about day, an hour. Pick a particular day. Yeah, it takes uh, about an hour per vessel, depending on size and so on. We, we have all the checklists and, and whatnot. It's also a good way to publicize us. You see. We get we get free publicity out of it, and maybe even a member or two. Mm. Ooh. Be nice. <laughs> flare days. Uh, this is this is the final slide, I believe. No. Flare days. We the next uh, one's the final slide. Then, right? We are uh, uh, one of the few organizations that will go out and collect and dispose of expired flares. Um, our flare days is, are coming up. Uh, it'll be on the next slide. It'll be on the next slide, okay. Um, anyhow, we, we collect and dispose of all your expired flares. Uh, we do not take road flares. And what's the other one we take? We don't take? Uh, anyway, it doesn't uh, matter. We, we will sort through them. We only take, you know, well, any of the flares. expired flares, smoke the flares. The police force won't take these anymore, and the, uh, matter of fact, they'd probably get shot if you tried to get into yeah. a police station with a bunch of flares. Nor will the fire department. Nor will the fire department. Um, so this is a good deal, and what most people don't know is it's uh, four years and they're expired, which is... We, we see this dropping as the new electronic flares come on board. Uh, there is, the Transport Canada has recently uh, approved an electronic flare that's, that's permanent and in conjunction with uh, smoke flares. You still have to have a smoke flare, but you can use an electronic uh, flare. Uh, there's only one approved manufacturer at the moment, and that's serious. Things about 400 bucks, but when you, by the time you start paying for flares, uh, it uh, amortizes very quickly. So, flare day, when? Friday, April 24th, and Saturday, it's April 14th, and Saturday the 15th. Oops. Oops. <laughs> well, so I, took, the, I 14th, took that off your site. <laughs> 14th and 15th of April, we'll be at the Chandlery uh, collecting flares. Um, so if you want to put that out to your members, anybody who has expired flares, bring them on down. We'll look so after them. We box them up and they get shipped back to CIL. Yeah. And they dispose of them. CIL Orion take care of all the shipping costs and disposal and that kind of thing. Um, and, and they do it safely, not going out lighting it and pretending. So everybody I presume knows where the Chandler is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's everybody's favorite place <laughs> to spend money. That's, that's the uh, depository of your bank. Yeah. So, any further questions? And I will take questions from the audience if you have any. Okay, here comes another one. I'm intrigued what your, what your reach or success is. 
do you, do you, do you feel you're touching most of the, let's, let's go with power boaters, most of the power boaters in the country or a tiny fraction? What, what, what's your sense? I think, well, it, it, it's, it's hard, hard to, to say. I don't, we don't have a statistic on it. Um, generally, you know, we get a lot of people coming in and realizing that the PCOC wasn't enough. And it's not because somebody went and told them that. They learned that themselves, probably in a scary situation. Um, as of COVID, as of the pandemic, boat sales have really rocketed because getting out on the water was one of the few things you could do. You know, with your bubble, you could go out. And so a lot of new boats got sold. So what we're trying to do, and I can't answer your question by numbers, by any means, but we're trying to get into the marinas and say, look, at, tell these people that they've got to have, for instance, an operator certificate before they can legally drive the boat. And then tell them that that alone is not enough for you to be comfortable in your boat out there. You know, you're going to be on the you know, white knuckling it all the time. So no, it's funny, I, I don't know how many pub boats are on the country. I wouldn't be surprised, I would guess it's probably half a million, something like that in yeah. the country. I'm just wondering how many touch points you guys achieve a year. Well, you, you see, the thing I think we don't reach are the back lakes, fishermen, and all, right. and the, a lot of cottagers um, yeah. that are, you know, uh, and guys that have been, you know, boating without any form of license or whatever for, you know, 50 years and uh, don't need it as far as they're concerned. So, I mean, it's not just our extra courses. The PCOC probably is maybe half the yeah. voters. Yeah, and, and if you and consider all the, the you know, the... Yeah. Uh, and don't forget there, there are the indigenous people that in the north that yeah. or throughout the country that, that They've never taken a course. They've, they don't even have a PCOC, most of them. And, and those are people we're trying to reach. We're trying to reach the backcountry guys. We're trying to reach, we're trying to reach everybody that has a boat. And um, I read somewhere there are more boats in Canada than there are people, uh, which is a, it's a weird statistic, but I read that somewhere. Uh, Anyhow, that's, that's, the, that's the kind of people we're trying to reach. Um, you know, we're, we've got radio, we've got one guy going up north and he's teaching yeah. rangers and, and uh, that's the uh, Inuit staff how to use a radio. Yeah. So that's, that's coming up in the next little while. And the the method of teaching those courses are different. We have to simplify the courses. It, it's not because the people are, are illiterate or any of that kind of thing. And don't get me wrong, they, they're, they're smarter than we are. Um, it's just that their way of learning is different. And we have to adapt to their culture. Yeah, I, I, culture is the word, I think. And, and it's, it's culture. <coughs> so. You know, if they say, we don't need this, well, maybe you do. And we have to convince them that that's what we have to do. Anyhow, that's, any other questions? You talked about culture. I think one of the difficulties that you may have in uh, encouraging people to take courses is the uh, very low level of enforcement that has been in past with respect to a number of different things that we're supposed to have. Uh, 20 or 25 years ago, I taught the uh, ROC Maritime here at the boat club, and a number of people took the exam, and I provided it at the time uh, I did work at Industry Canada, well, it was Communications Canada, I believe, at that time, and then it became Industry Canada. 
And then uh, later, I think as time changed, uh, there was a certain liability associated with me providing uh, those uh, certificates uh, and endorsing the uh, uh, licenses that I was issuing or the, the certificates. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I uh, exited from that particular uh, role and nobody really realized or understood that they should continue to take that because there was no enforcement ever other than to say somewhere on some government document that you're supposed to have one uh, I've never been asked personally where is mine I have it but it might take a little while to find it and uh, I guess over the last 25 years since I've had a uh, what is it a, the uh, marine operator certificate I've only been asked once, and that was when I was running around an inflatable with a uh, uh, nothing on other than a, a bathing suit. Uh, no wallet, no nothing. And they said, well, where is it? And I said, well, it's right over there, but they weren't too interested in going over there to get it. Uh, they issue, uh, at that time, I think the first one I had was uh, paper. Uh, now at least they're plastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, which was good thinking, because if you're supposed to have them, and it's in a boat, uh, they don't last long. Uh, so, uh, and of course there's no picture on them. So uh, mine's as good for you or, as, or for me, depending on who you, you know, where you are. Yeah, so. well it should at least match your PCOC card when you, name-wise, when you show them that sort of thing. I think the, uh, the issue here is, um, so the Coast Guard is, is mainly big water and rescue. And, th and their biggest interest is commercial, yeah. the commercial. And all navigation uh, resources into marks and et cetera, et cetera, are all commercial yeah. because the commercial guys pay for it. Mm -hmm. All the stuff you have out here, the recreational stuff, is deteriorating and in some cases disappearing because there's, um, unless you start paying for it, the government's not going to bother. So on the inland waterways, the police forces, the local police force, or the OPP in, in this province, are responsible for policing this sort of thing. Well, you'll see them out maybe twice a summer. Although they're, they've got some pretty fancy boats now. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but they just don't have the resources, I think, mm -hmm. to follow it up. Yeah. So they'll pick a day like July 1st when they know the place will be flooded with um, and go out and nail the people. It, but you're right, the enforcement is non existent. It's rather lacking part. here. Yeah, compared to the United States where I've traveled, I mean, I went down to Florida and back, and you could be stopped and boarded at any point in time by yeah. the American Coast Guard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they didn't ask permission. Well, they just said, we're coming aboard. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a few things you should know if you're in the States. Don't get too, na don't get too close to a Navy ship. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I was ordered out of yeah, the, yeah. Uh, out and, of the and don't And don't anchor under a bridge. True, yeah. So there's that's the other, that's another thing that uh, they figure you're there to blow it up, I guess. And, you know, they're, they're pretty, shaky down there, but the Coast Guard is so much more massive down there than it is here. So. Um, with right. respect to the uh, ROC and the uh, PCOC uh, courses, those courses, because they're mandated by government agencies, all are uh, examiners and providers have to be registered with those agencies. Um, so you rest assured that the person giving you the exam for PCOC or uh, maritime radio is is a recognized um, provider and examiner and are fully knowledgeable. Okay, so that those those are the only two courses that require. Uh, that type of uh, official them because they are government uh, organizations. Any further questions? Well, 
Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. I was just wondering if there's any questions online. No? Okay, there's none come in over the chat, uh, chat system. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, that was uh, quite a good outline of uh, both what the Canadian sale and or power and sail squadron. I guess I, I'm showing my bias here. My, the Canadian sail and power squadron. Yeah, they added sail in 1980. Well, I just gave it first billing. That's all. <laughs> so thank you again, gentlemen. Um, I think I'd like to proceed with a uh, token of gratitude for you two uh, coming and spending your evening here uh, tonight with us and talking uh, to us and also to uh, extending, um, uh, okay, we've done questions and answers, uh, extending um, your uh, time here. So if you'd like to, we'll make this, um, available to you. Uh, we have a regalia shop here at the Nepean Sailing Club, and uh, these are um, two cards. Uh, there's a QR code on the back of them. Uh, each one of them uh, gives you a $40 uh, gift certificate associated with uh, the regalia shop, and uh, you can uh, have a look at what's there and buy uh, whatever you might like, uh, um, hats, shirts, whatever. So thank you very much for your time and uh, your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're so I guess uh, that um, brings things uh, to a close with the exception of uh, the Legacy Fund. Uh, that's where we are uh, tonight, I think I've already shown that slide uh, to you. Um, we're, li we're over halfway and uh, we don't have uh, tonight's proceeds in as yet, but uh, uh, just mention that. And um, the next thing, uh, winter speaker series uh, for next week, keeping your boat here at NSC. And uh, I think maybe with respect to what Dominic has suggested, Maybe we should be thinking about uh, a, uh, a talk about where you should not go and where the rocks are going to come up and get you if you do go. So uh, that might be a very interesting addition to what Corey is going to speak about, even though it's outside the harbor uh, next week. So uh, in any case, uh, uh, look forward to seeing you all next week. So thank you very much for your attending. Appreciate that. <laughs>